Okay, good evening, everyone. Or rather, good afternoon good, and good morning as well to those that are joining from uh, different parts of the world. Well, my name is Ning. I'm the program manager at Pure 71, and that's Port Innovation Ecosystem Reimagined at Block 71. And I have a co host with me today, and that's Felicia, who is from TMB Ventures, one of the co organizers of Smartport Challenge 2021. We're back here today to explore two innovation opportunities in Smartport Challenge 2021. Um, the first one's coming from Singapore Association of Ship Suppliers and Services, or rather SAS. And the second one is from MMA Offshore. Um, all right, so I think we'll kick off the session with the first one uh, that's being uh, turned out by SAS. And the title would be Transforming the Role of Boarding Officers by, um, and, and it's sponsored by SAS. And today we have four members from the society <clears throat> and they also represent their own uh, organizations. So we have Jamie from Conlash, we have Fazal from Black Sea Marine, uh, Zach from Anchor Marine and Nelson from Nautical Marine. And these are members of SAS who are also stakeholders in the ship supplies industry. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy to have you with us today. So I'm gonna let you introduce yourself very, very quickly. Uh, perhaps also share with us what SAS is all about. Um, uh, because we do have friends and entrepreneurs who may not be familiar with uh, your organization. So can we have maybe Fazal to kick off? Hi guys, um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, my name is Fazal, I'm from Black Sea Marine, uh, ship suppliers in Singapore. Uh, SAS is basically the ship suppliers association in Singapore. And uh, we have uh, a lot of members who are both ship suppliers as well as suppliers to the ship suppliers. As, as uh, you may have noticed, we are also inclusive of service providers. Like for example, one of our colleagues here, uh, Nelson, is actually from uh, Nautical Marine, which is a boat operator that uh, helps do all these supplies to vessels that are at the anchorage. You know, so some of the vessels that are berthed, some are in, out at sea. So these uh, these are organized through boats, which Nelson is one of the companies that uh, does that. So uh, it's an inclusive uh, association that uh, basically uh, it was started maybe about 40 years ago. Uh, all the local ship suppliers, they wanted to have a common place where all the, uh, you know, we can circulate information, anything that comes from Jurong Port or PSA or any global news that affects us. Everything is centralized in this association. And we help our members as well by working with uh, Enterprise Singapore and many other associations and organizations to help them to develop their capabilities as well. So I'm, I'm just summing it up because we have a pretty long program ahead. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make it very quick. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Fazal. Um, so this is a very unique problem statement that's being supported by the association covering uh, all kinds of stakeholders uh, from the suppliers, the boat operators, all trying to uh, resolve an, uh, a challenge that is being felt by many parties uh, in this whole uh, value chain. So we also have Jamie. Jamie, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit and probably um, share about what Conlash uh, does too? Hi everyone, I'm Jamie, I'm from Conlash. So uh, Conlash has been a member of SES from um, quite long ago, I believe. <laughs> I mean, we are a 30 year old company and uh, we are a ship chandler. So that means we uh, supply provisions and technical products to any ports that are calling at the port of, uh, for any vessels that are calling at the port of. Hmm. Okay, Nelson, what about you? Uh, Nelson, we're going to have to remind you to unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah, hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Nelson from Nautica Marine. Uh, basically, my company operates a supply boat where we deliver cargoes from shore to the vessels and anchorages. So I th we, we just joined SASS, I think, about two, three years back. So I think they are looking to you know, get companies from different industry groups that plays a part of the whole supply chain to join SASS. So I'm uh, very happy to join SASS and also to join this uh, webinar. Thank you. And finally, we have Zach. 
Hi guys, uh, I'm Zach. I'm from Anchor Marine. I'm also representing SASS. Um, Anchor Marine is quite similar to um, Cornish and Black Sea in, in that we are a supplier as well to uh, vessels calling on the port of Singapore. Um, we've been around for about 40 years or so. Uh, and uh, we are happy to be participating in this uh, and hopefully we can answer your questions. Thank you. And um, while there's a special request to play uh, the very short, a very short uh, 2D animation video to just give you a very quick overview of what, um, you know, this innovation opportunity is and why are we transforming the role of a boarding officer and what exactly is a boarding officer. And after that, we're going to jump right into um, the, problem, the problem statement a little bit more uh, deeply. So can we have the video up on, on screen, please? When ships call at a port, they obtain all necessary commodities from ship suppliers when berthing or at anchorage. A boarding officer assumes an overall responsibility for the delivery process from the time warehouse personnel have inspected and packed the goods until the customer takes ownership on board vessels. The boarding officer also handles various documents required by ship suppliers, inland revenue agency and customs, while on board, he obtains the signatories required for completing the delivery and all other formalities required for tax reclaim and custom clearance purposes. Very often, he is also required to handle missing items, defects, and inaccurate orders. Where possible, he communicates with colleagues or other suppliers to resolve any pending issues before the vessel departs. As ships move in and out of ports 24 hours a day, boarding officers are required to work irregular hours. With tight schedules and unanticipated events, work can be challenging. The current COVID-19 pandemic has also restricted them to working on shores. The Singapore Association of Ship Suppliers and Services wants to transform the way boarding officers work by reducing the need for physical interaction. The solution should enable boarding officers to obtain digital signatures and validate their authenticity in compliance with the Inland Revenue Authority of Singapore and Singapore Customs. It should also allow them to remotely perform verification of delivered items with the crew, as well as communicate with them in real time to assist with any queries or concerns they may have. All right, so, okay, so now we just um, went through the video. So perhaps uh, we can just uh, have Faza to actually share uh, more concisely about what the problem is, because it's actually seemed like a very tough challenge to address and um, only very minimally like explained by the video. Yeah. Right, hi guys. Uh, first of all, I'm not in a cruise ship. This is just a background. <laughs> None of us are that free, unfortunately, but anyway, um, okay. The problem we have is actually not just, uh, you know, just a straightforward one. It, 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 there's a few layers to it. So allow me to explain to you how, you know, it works right now when you're going to the port. So everything is packed and uh, the boarding officer assumes a responsibility. It usually a uh, boarding officer and driver, usually it's, it might be the same person. So let's just say that this person is going, so he's bringing the supplies into the port. Uh, first, let's say he's bringing in some bonded goods. That means like alcohol, cigarettes, duty-free items. So he has to take a customs permit, the bonded permit. He has to first give it to an office, the, the customs office. They will stamp it uh, physically, right? So stamp it and they'll just do a light inspection just to make sure it tallies with what is written on the uh, permit. And then after that, next, just next to the counter, you have a uh, officer who will check your entry pass. So when you're going in, you have an entry pass for a PSA, it's the ship supply notice. So it has the details of what 
how many pallets of cargo, the driver detail will be there and you know, the PSA pass number, just some light details so they can verify who is entering. These are all paper, that means physical paper. You can't enter with any kind of electronic, uh, you know, you can have something on your phone, but you can't. It requires physical hard copy for you to give and verify, right? So after you're done with that, you go into the port, somehow through the maze, you find the right berth and uh, you, you know, you load all your supplies. And when you're done with that, uh, the crew will be checking. So they have a checklist, they'll check everything. Everything's, let's assume everything's okay. Uh, you have a document, the delivery order, which they will uh, endorse with the, the master will have his uh, stamp and he will sign and give it back to you. This is basically what happens. But as you can tell, there's a lot of physical documents that you need to keep hold of. For example, after you finish your uh, signing the in, uh, for invoices, if you're bringing the invoices, you sign the invoices, you keep them because when we do a tax reclaim back to IRAS, because you know these goods are being exported out of Singapore. So you're going to do a tax reclaim. You claim back the GST that you know when you buy locally, you buy from your suppliers, they will charge you GST 7% because it's a local sale. But then because you're now exporting these goods out, you will reclaim this back. So for that tax reclaim process, uh, you have to keep the document, this uh, DO, this invoices, that is your evidence that these goods have been sold outside. So that's paperwork again. So the problem here we're faced with is, uh, it's not really something that I would say is, ah, you know, crushing pain, uh, we're really feeling physical pain. It's not so much of that. But the problem is that, why do we have all these you know, physical documents. What is, is it really necessary for us to maintain so many steps whereby, you know, uh, everything is, has to be a paper, you know, they have to check the paper. Can it not be done electronically? Is there no way for us? For example, I ordered Domino's pizza yesterday and I knew exactly what's happening. Like they have this five stage, you know, preparing, baking, and, you know, it keeps updating itself and you know everything that happens in port. I mean, not in port, sorry, in, in the uh, oven, right? So you, you have a clear picture, and this is just Domino's pizza. Here we're talking about a mega port, whereby, you know, you've got so many things happening, but we have little to no information on what goes on because there's no tracking ability. And then when your goods go on board, let's say there's a problem, it's also not possible to check all this because you don't have communication unless you step onto the vessel yourself. And at this current time, it's exacerbated because you can tell very clearly that there are restrictions with boarding vessels. So if they say this item is missing, that item is missing, you're just, okay, fine, what can you do? Just cancel it off the invoice and there's nothing further you can do. So this is the situation we're faced with. Boarding offices have you know, so many documents that they need to be concerned with where it might just be a lot easier if they had some kind of electronic system or an app or something, some kind of software whereby if you could merge all these services inside, you could actually save a lot of time, a lot of uh, paper and uh, really make things more seamless. That's, that's basically what is one of the problems we're facing. The other Thank problem- you so much. Yeah, Fazal, so I, 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 I'm going to have to interrupt you a little bit because I wanted yeah. to uh, clarify some things like, sure. um, so first of all, I know we're trying to remove the need to have paper documents and everything, but things needs to be documented somewhere, right? So I want to ask uh, maybe the panel, um, is paper document like mandatory or is, or can it actually uh, legally or, I don't know, uh, by rule, be replaced by some form of other documentation besides, you know, of having a physical piece of paper. Okay. Um, since we have my dear colleagues who are all learned as well, I will pass this over to Zach. He will answer you. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Fazal. Um, uh, in short, Yes, uh, for for documents that um, that are required by different authorities, uh, namely I think IRAS and uh, the customs, uh, we are currently keeping uh, 
hard copies of uh, some of the documents for, for, for different reasons. For example, for customs, uh, as Fazal explained earlier, um, you need a copy to, to enter into the gate and to get it endorsed and to have them verify that the goods that we are sending into the, uh, uh, the port and uh, then onto the ship uh, has been checked. Uh, and there's the exact amount of uh, what we have declared uh, going in. Um, so um, some of these steps do need the cooperation of uh, both the authorities as well as the, um, the different ports and they, are, they have their own regulations as well. Uh, for example, PSE and Jewel Port and all. Uh, you have to ensure that all of them are on board with a similar digital solution uh, so that it will be seamless. Because if any one party uh, is requesting for a hard copy still, uh, then uh, we would see, we imagine that there would be some difficulties, uh, uh, even if we digitalize the, uh, the recipe. So this is a very big trouble, not really a trouble, uh, but it's it's um, a challenge statement that's really huge because it's involving a lot of uh, parties, right? Not just people within uh, your industry, but then practically the customs and all that. So we do need consensus uh, to move forward. Uh. So with it being such a big problem, let's say, and, and, and I foresee negotiations and, and discussions and, and probably having to go on uh, with multi-parties, right? But immediately I would say, is there any part of that big solution that can be resolved without having to get into a multi-party uh, discussion? Uh, I think um, from the chats we've had with the authorities, uh, what they're looking for is a um, proposal for a solution first. So I think that's the first step we need to take. Uh, we need to have some sort of prototype uh, where we can present uh, to them uh, and, and seek their approval. So I think the, the first step is to have a system that works within the industry. Uh, and then we can show, okay, this is something that uh, the industry agrees upon. Uh, can we get your buy-in to this as well, right? Mm -hmm. So I think I think that's the logical flow, lah. Things lah. And um, with regards to um, the uh, the bigger problem statement, I think I see there's two different parts. So I think Fazal has touched uh, quite a bit on the documentation part of things, and then the other um, part of it uh, is with regards to the interfacing, right? So uh, COVID, COVID, and all. Uh, a lot of uh, face to face interactions, clarifications of missing items, and things like that, as well as uh, you know, maybe certain um, uh, cash that needs to be transacted. Um, so, so things like that, uh, uh, I think, uh, areas as well that we can uh, look for solutions in without having to um, deal with the uh, getting the buy in and the approval for the authorization of uh, documentation, digital documentation. Okay, so on, on that point, can you share a little bit more, paint the scenario a little bit for our um, audience to understand? Um, you know, I, I guess that has got to do with transforming the role of the boarding officer that you're talking about, right? And uh, be before you proceed, I'd just like to remind everyone that if you have questions, you can drop them into the Q&A function. Thank you. All right, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, just, just, um, okay, so so just on that portion of the, the interfacing, right? So I think uh, I can break it down in two parts, right? So one part is the, the there needs to be some sort of um, video interface, I suppose, that, uh, uh, that's able to connect with the crew from the ship, right? So what are the problems we have for that is that, of course, you guys might be aware that uh, on vessels, they are relying on uh, uh, satellite instead uh, most of the time. Uh, and that tends to be a bit expensive. Um, so any solution would have to circumvent that, right? Uh, the other portion I think uh, that is uh, worth thinking about as well is that uh, they do handle uh, sometimes uh, cash and um, uh, whether it's collection of cash or whether it's delivery of cash uh, to the vessel. Um, so agents, for instance, sometimes our owners would uh, require them to uh, hand over uh, amount of cash to the vessel so that the, when they go to the big spot, we have uh, some cash in hand where they can uh, maybe purchase the necessities or uh, uh, pay the fees uh, on the spot, right? So this uh, transaction of cash, I think it's, it's uh, there can be, I, I imagine, some sort of uh, 
digital uh, solution to that uh, where uh, the transaction can happen uh, without the physical cash being exchanged. Yeah, so I think these, these uh, two portions, the video interfacing and the uh, transaction of uh, financial uh, of hard, hard cash, I think uh, areas where potentially like to seek some solutions for. Okay, thank you, Zach. So um, also I'd like to check about the market size since like it seems like a niche problem. Market size? Uh, well, I, I, I don't have offhand the, uh, the size of this uh, the ship supplies market. I, I don't know if any of my colleagues, maybe Jamie or Fazal, do you have any uh, uh, sensing of how big this market is in Singapore or worldwide? Or maybe from your experience, like, you know, how many, a guesstimate maybe, like, um, trips do, do you have to make as a whole um, to do this ship supplies, to deliver supplies? Depends per company, right? Because for every order, we would have to send boarding officers. So depending on how the company sales are, we do like up to 20 trips a day or you can consolidate. I mean, the maybe in Singapore, like ship suppliers, I would say there are hun, like ship chandlers alone, maybe hundreds. But this is not a problem that I think is just based like, like a Singapore thing. I probably other countries are also facing the same thing, right? Mm. Yeah. So I, I I think it's hard to estimate like how many ex how many trips exactly, like. Mm. Okay. So um, quite a lot, quite a fair bit, uh, Because uh, this is Singapore's a huge transshipment hub, so you can probably uh know that there are so many stops that, uh, so many vessels making a stop here to pick up supplies and as well and and to replenish to replenish, uh, and everything. So I, I, I'm also interested to ask, right, since the inception of probably this um, ship supplies industry, has there been changes in ways, um, you know, rather any technological adoption in to help um, make a boarding officer's job easier um, in, in some ways? Or has it always been this, um, this manual? Um. If I may take a yeah, quick one, and then I hand it over to Jamie. You see, there are some suppliers, can you hear me? Yep. Right. There are some suppliers who have developed uh, e-port capabilities. That means, you know, you don't need paper. You can just sign on, you know, this thing, you know, like a tablet or whatever for deliveries. But you see, there is still an element that requires the paper because customs still require, if you have bonded stores, you have to endorse this permit at the point of entry mm. very strictly. There's no what if, there is no such thing. You have to. So you see, if you have one element, you can, as a company, you can go to ESG and get a grant, go and do all kinds of digitalization on your site and get the best technology out there, make your deliveries very efficient and no paper. But if you're still going to have to bring at least two forms. One is the entry into the port, uh, DSA for Jurong port and SSN for the DSA port. And the other one is the bonded permit. These are uh, absolutely have to be paper. I mean, you, you don't have, it's, it's not connected. It's not seamless. You have just one part, which is e-port. What's the point? Mm. There are people who do that, but you see, you still need the certain things. You still need the original stamp, this, that, you know, this is it's just not a whole, whole solution. So Company conversation has to happen. La. Conversation with the authorities yeah, yeah. has to happen. For sure. But they have also said that what they need is a secure uh, method or a solution. I, I suppose that's a requirement. Anything else? Uh, Jamie, you want to add something? Uh, not, not really. I mean, for the paper documents, Probably some things can be digital, digitalized, but I'm not sure how many ship chandlers have, have utilized this EPOD thing because there's another problem, right, that we face is to get the physical uh, vessel stem as well. So, I mean, we can't stem on the 
we can't stand on the device, right? So that is another thing that we might need to tackle also. So that's the stem that probably the master has, is it? Yeah, so every vessel, they have a unique uh, vessel stem. And uh, one of the, I mean, we've been think, talking about this for quite a while. And one of the solutions is, or oh, maybe we could get them to, you know, upload like a, like a picture of the stem, you know, on, on, on our device or our app. And then we have a 2FA. So if they, are, if they say that, okay, this DO is good to go, then we, they can approve their, their stem there. But I think it's just something that's been, you know, spoken about, but we haven't actually progressed uh, beyond that. Okay. Uh, well, that can only happen if, uh, if, if everyone comes to the table and, and, and agree to move forward with some kind of model, right? Yeah. But I know that you're also interested to uh, improve one bit of uh, the situation, which is to help the boarding officers um, improve their their work by allowing them, by giving them some technology to do communications back uh, to your office. Um, can, can you explain a little bit about that? So maybe this one, maybe Zach can expound on it. Well, like how we're so de democratic, uh, we just... <laughs> uh, okay, sorry, uh, do you mind repeating the question, please? Yeah, so I was told that, uh, you know, very often boarding officers have to handle missing items, defects and inaccurate orders, right? And whenever possible, you need to communicate with your colleagues and other suppliers to resolve any issues before the vessels uh, depart. And so this bit, um, sometimes you don't have a call center that's 24 hours. And we all know that boarding officers, they make their trips not just uh, while the sun is out, sometimes it's also at night when there's no a lack of support and everything. And um, and I remember uh, your team mentioning that you want to improve on on this bit, um, you know, by by giving the boarding officers some kind of a technology or tools to yep. help them do their job better. Yeah, yeah. So what we are mentioning is this. Um, I think one of the details that's important is that it's very time consuming. Uh, for each trip that the boarding officer makes, and I think uh, Nelson would be able to put the level on this part. Uh, it takes quite a while depending on the entry location of the vessel. So if a, a vessel is um, um, berthed at a certain eastern entry that's far off from uh, our loading at say from Juru Terminal, right? Each trip could take uh, upwards of two to three hours uh, one way. So two ways would be six hours, right? So we would be... Um, sending a, a guy up for six hours at a minimum uh, for technically maybe an hour's work, right? So he's on board a vessel for an hour, goes there three hours, comes back three hours, right? So, so that whole portion is quite inefficient uh, in terms of uh, manpower as it is. We are, we are quite short of uh, people, who are trained people who are able to do this, right? So uh, one of the ideas that was proposed uh, is to... Um, have a person that's onshore, uh, if there's some sort of interfacing capabilities, uh, um, he's able to uh, manage and uh, communicate with the customer for multiple vessels at the same time, right? So if he doesn't have to physically be there, uh, but we can have the, uh, the benefits of him being there, the, 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 the face time and the interaction with the customer and resolving the problems as well, uh, then we would technically be able to, to uh, make the person who is um, manning this um, sort of station uh, be more productive and be able to handle uh, uh, multiple vessels uh, in that maybe seven, eight hour period that he would otherwise be using just one vessel. Mm. So this challenge seven is, is huge and it's heavy and it's, it's, it's also pertinent because uh, with COVID-19, we all know that uh, access to ports is now uh, very, very, very difficult and tough and, and, and all that. So being able to transform a job is, is, is essential. Um, and it sounds to me like this problem statement needs to be chopped up uh, into a couple of uh, segments. Uh, discussions need to take place and not just uh, with the members in the industry, but then to other, with other authorities as well. And what is great about this innovation opportunity is that it's being supported by SAS, uh, which brings together with them the members or the stakeholders that are already within the ship supplies industry. And I think that's a that's a plus point to me uh, because there's the backing and support uh, rallying, you know, uh, from the society itself. Now we are running out of time, so I'm just going to ask you uh, two last questions. Right, one is, 
if you are given three sentences to wrap up, can you share with me what do you want the solution to achieve? You can do it in bullet points and whatever it is, but you know, in, in key points, what, what should the solution help you do succinctly? Maybe each one of you can contribute one or two. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll be our Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, I mean, contributing from the, uh, giving the perspective of the sea transporter side. So uh, I think uh, let's say if we do come up with a solution or a platform to, to solve this whole digitization of these DOs. I think we need also uh, you know, think for the other companies also who are, who are also dealing with the land transport and also the sea transport because the solution has to be linked up right between all the parties because it forms the entire supply chain so all the way from the warehouse to the land transporter to the to the sea transporter and then to the vessels and then of course the including the ship suppliers the solution has to be seamless. It has to gel up. You know, everybody has to be trained in this platform that we come up with. So I think this is one of the important points that we have to take note of. Mm, okay. So there's linking all the parties involved, at least to do one trip. Correct. From the from the land to the sea. Okay. Right. Because it's what? not just uh, the, the, the issue that we are dealing with. It's not just solely, you know, when we are delivering at the ship site, right? Because once the cargoes leave from the warehouse, from warehouse also, uh. correct. So we have to think from the point of the cargoes leaving from the warehouse all the way until the completion of the delivery at the vessels. So we got a, you know, when we when we come up with this solution, we have to think of the whole picture. Yeah, Meaning so that you have to link the suppliers all the way down. Yes, correct. Let's say if we are thinking of like uh, doing an EDO, uh, electronic deal, we have to think of the whole supply chain. Okay, what about you, Jamie? Okay, for me, if I have to like summarize it, right, rather than say transform the role of a boarding officer, I would say like maybe transform the entire the, the entire process of how goods are being delivered. Because I mean, this has been done for, I, you know, you, earlier you asked whether any changes has been made. I don't think, I think this has been done for just the last 30 years how it is or maybe just nowadays they can have handphone now whereas last time they need to go <laughs> online you know something like that so every day i mean i see my boarding officer they are carrying like thick stacks of documents from from internally and from like you know what uh, the, the agency so if we could have just one app for them from start to end that can serve not just the needs of the agencies but also the um, internally like if we have any return items and, and collection of like data that would help us, I think that would be good. You know, they would have less to, I think it would add value to, to the job as well. It's not just delivery men and ca carrying all these like manual, manual things, you know. You're speaking from point of view of being a supplier. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Fazal? I'm not the best at summarizing things. I will attempt to. Um, right, so as my friends have uh, shared already, uh, the problem for us is that it has, it's this, like I said at the start, this is, there's so many layers to this problem. You yeah. can't just look at it as just a logistics problem or, you know, uh, trying to upskill the workers or not. That's not just it. It comes down to a very simple thing. Right now, today, if I want to track my guys who go inside the port, I can't. Because I have no idea what time they enter, because that information will not come to me. You know, it's you know, I think when they enter, there is uh, some there is some information being extracted, but it doesn't come to us. It goes into the maybe the system of PSA or whatever. So I don't know what time he enters. I don't know what he's doing inside, unless he just takes pictures. You know, they could be sitting there for six hours, not doing anything, and no one would come and ask them anything mm. because it's that busy inside the port. So in terms of uh, operation side, I'm looking at from operations point of view, I need some kind of uh, verification, some kind of uh, accountability. How long does it take to complete a supply? If you ask me, I won't be able to answer you this question because one guy will say six hours, one guy will say three hours. I'm not sure. It depends on a lot of factors, but at least I should be able to track each stage 
for example, when we enter, when the pallet has gone up, you know, when uh, the checking has commenced, when the next, you know, who, who, who are the suppliers? You know, how many suppliers are waiting? Is the crane being blocked? So much information. And all this could be done if there was one app or some kind of integrated software where you log in, you have everything you need. Everything it's is there. To me, like there's a lot of data that can be captured exactly. and to help you make sense uh, and, and, and plan uh, insights basically, yeah. right? So exactly. that's what you're asking for. Because that's also part of the entire solution yep. that you should have some way to track what's happening inside the port. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And Zach, any any maybe last sentence or? Uh, not last much to add. I think my colleagues have uh, have said most of it. I think okay. the end product everyone agrees. Uh, it's it's something that uh, the technology is really there for all these separate things. It's just putting it together and interfacing with other uh, relevant apps like from the ports and all, uh, so that all the data is synced into one uh, particular app that can be used by our warning officers. I think that's okay. that's the, the, the all right. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Now, um, I, I know that uh, you have kind of seeded uh, uh, an idea amongst uh, solution providers already that you're looking for an app. But maybe let's, let me just put it out there that um, we're looking for a solution that would help maybe not revolutionize the industry, but then um, to make processes better, to generate data so that better insights and insights can be obtained and then better decisions can be made uh, things that would be more efficient and uh, and to uplift the entire industry. Yeah. And for this particular innovation opportunity, it's being backed by SES. So I suppose uh, whoever that you choose to work with in the future um, would have your support to understand this very huge problem statement uh, deeper. And what's great is that you have multiple stakeholders in, in your association. So that means uh, testing and everything, uh, getting different kinds of opinions would not be an issue. Am I right? Is that the kind of support that you'd be able to extend? Ready, ready members to test out. La. Very eager ones to see. I see Faza giving me a thumbs up. Okay, that's great. All right, thank you very much, guys. We don't have a lot of time. I'm going to have to jump right uh, off to a second innovation opportunity that is being championed by MMA Offshore. So thank you, guys. I'm going to invite Greg to come online. Thank you. Thank Hi, you. Greg. You. I'm so sorry we took time from your segment, but then no problem. Um, it was quick. it was a very interesting uh, problem statement that they mentioned. So I'm just going to jump right in and have you introduce yourself uh, to our friends who are watching here as well as uh, on, on Facebook. Right. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to present and be a part of the, or the process. Um, it's a great opportunity. Um, so as you mentioned, my name is Greg and I'm from MMA Offshore um, and we're a marine solutions provider. So we have a, a range of vessels um, that predominantly serve the offshore oil and gas and renewables industry. Um, and we also have a, pro a project logistics division as well as a subsea engineering part of our business as well. Um, so that's our, our, our business in general, uh, mainly serving oil and gas, renewables, um, defence and infrastructure markets. Um, and my role within, within that organisation is, is um, I'm responsible for the group corporate strategy as well as the innovation. And, and part of the innovation program is working with early stage companies, um, startups or, or ventures in um, developing solutions for, for the industry. So um, it's right up the alley of, of the Smart Port Challenge and it's great to be involved to help solve this challenge that we've, that we've highlighted around um, sea fastening of uh, out of gauge equipment. All right, uh, since you already mentioned uh, about fastening of out of gauge uh, cargo, can you explain to us what that means? Yeah, for sure. So I guess it's different to your condition, your, your traditional container shipping or, or um, standardized equipment, which there is existing solutions and methodologies for, um, whereas our industry and offshore vessels typically carry cargo or equipment, which is bespoke and has different dimension, size, um, and challenges in sea fastening to, to, the, to the standardized equipment. Um, so that's what we mean by we say out of gauge, because each equipment type is often unique and, and have, has its own challenges um, in, in the sea fastening of that. So um, the difficulties come in that around the time consuming nature of, of 
um, sea fastening each piece of equipment um, and, and cargo to the deck. So, so it's a it's a it's a process, a lengthy process, um, where each piece is uniquely sea fastened, calculated, um, and goes through a process of um, classification approvals before um, it, it is deemed to be seaworthy and and the vessel can go on its way. That's really interesting, isn't it? To be honest, I I always. We, we always see those container ships, right, around Pasir Panjang and everything. And at most, we see bulk carriers and sometimes those that carry uh, cars. Uh, but I have never seen one that carry uh, an extraordinarily big equipment and all that. Do we actually have them uh, along the shores? Yes. Uh, yeah, as you say, probably not as, it's not as bulk or it's not as many vessels as, as you'd see. And they're not quite to the scale as some of the, uh, container container vessels. So that's maybe why, but there certainly are a number of players, particularly in Singapore, mm. that are doing this, and a number, number of yards that are that are undertaking a lot of the sea fastening work as well. I see. And you yeah. mentioned that sea fastening is actually a very time consuming uh, process, right from the start. So can you walk us through a little bit to help us understand how do you plan uh, to get this done, and and which part of it of this problem that you're looking to um, solve? Yeah, sure, of course. So. Um, Part of the, the process is obviously understanding the load of each piece of equipment um, but, and then how to, how to fasten that down. So there's a bit of engineering work in the background that occurs um, to put together a sea fastening plan. Um, and then there's the work that gets undertaken. Um, and so when that occurs, there's often hot works and welding works that, that have to occur. Uh, and when that, when that piece of um, work occurs in a vessel, there's a requirement to um, clean out the tanks of the vessel and degas the tanks and remove any gas from the tanks from a safety perspective, um, obviously to avoid any explosions and the like. So all of that just compounds in the process that um, in, in the current process that adds to number of days. And then there's obviously a, once the work has been undertaken the welder, there's a cooling process and then a verification or a survey process whereby the classification society has to um, come in and, and or surveys come in and, and the work is verified. So typically, um, so, how long would that take? So it could take, um, you know, it could be four, around four days um, but then there's of actual work and, and um, approvals, but there's obviously pre-work around the engineering and um, load calculations and deck planning, which, which occurs well before that as well. Hmm. I yeah. see. Okay. And um, so you mentioned this being very time consuming. Have you tried any kinds of solutions before to minimize the time needed or anything to just improve it? Yeah, exactly. So um, we have uh, had a couple of um, attempts or, or use of various solutions around um, plates, um, using standardized plates for various A-frames. Um, and we have, um, and they, they remain on board the vessel. So there's no need to remove those plates and that allows the ability to reuse them to fasten um, the, and that was marginally successful for a particular type of equipment. Um, but the the total span of um, equipment that could be fastened to this was limited. So it was it was successful to a degree, and um, but I guess that sort of drove the fact that you know if we can come up with a solution that is wider and broader that can achieve this for, for multiple pieces of equipment, there is certainly benefits in doing that because when we did mobilize and demobilize equipment on and off and cargo on and off using this solution, we certainly found efficiencies in the process, uh, particularly around the, the removal of the needing to weld, for example, and therefore, as I said, removing um, the safety aspects around tank cleaning and degas in the tanks, et cetera. So um, they had, yeah, so that we have had solutions and tried so a, a, that, that's one solution that we've tried. And as I said, it's, it's been marginally successful, but we're looking for something I think that's broader and wider. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm really interested to know as well, which part or rather who in your team is the one that's facing the problem? So if I'm solving this problem, whose problem am I solving? Yeah, it's, it's, it's multiple stakeholders, right? So there, you know, if we come in as one, well, we can wear many hats as well, but as a vessel owner, it's the vessel that's often on charter or not on charter 
not earning revenue whilst it's being mobilised and the equipment's being mobilised on. There's the equipment, which the equipment or cargo, which is sometimes a third party equipment or um, or third party cargo that is also sitting waiting as it's going through this process. Um, of course, then there's the end clients that are involved as well, waiting for this equipment and, and the mobilization. So the costs, I guess, it's kind of a bulwark effect that there's many players involved and the, the costs and time compound, um, making the problem sizable to many people. Uh, and also reduces the you know the flexibility and the um, the ability to use vessels for different purposes gets constricted around cost and time. Whereas if you had a solution that was very flexible, the the platform of a vessel and the use of a vessel increases um, as it could move cargo on an awful lot easier. So if I were to ask this, um, if I have a solution to be to be presented. Who would be the one that's making a decision whether or not to use it? Ah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I think ultimately uh, there'll be this class classification society would need to be involved as it would need to be an approved solution. Uh, and of course, um, there's engineers that are involved in, uh, of course, in, in developing and verifying the stability and strength of the solution, um, as well as the. Um, the deck, deck strength and ability to, to cater for the, the solution. So there's probably a number of parties, but ultimately it's probably the, it's the vessel owners that um, would be accountable for, for, the, for the cargo on deck. I see. So it's probably uh, vessel owners that will have to make the decision, but it has to be approved by the classification society. Exactly. So that's a critical uh, party or stakeholder to, to convince. Exactly right. Mm. Okay. Um, I have one more question. Um, how would you measure success or how would you imagine success or to, to look like? It doesn't have to be a very ambitious, uh, huge improvement or, or, or whatever that you're looking for. It could be a huge Im improvement that you're looking for. Or it could be a, a marginal one. Uh, what are you gunning for? Yeah, so I think first and foremost, I think it's, it's process efficiency. So I think streamlining the process is, um, particularly whilst the vessel's being mobilized, that's um, that's a key metric. Uh, of course, safety always comes into that. So as I mentioned, welding and hot works, if we can avoid that, there's a safety aspects and that's, that's also a critical success factor for, for, for a potential solution. Um, so there's not necessarily a single metric, but there's a couple and of course cost that comes into that. So, um, which, which often comes with time. So time and cost come together, but, um, that's probably how we'd be able to measure success is around uh, yeah, speed and of course, sorry, and an ability to use the solution across a range of pieces of equipment or cargo, not just, as I said, one of the restrictions of the solution we have previously used was that the, it was limited in which types of cargo, uh, it was yeah, for a specific type of, uh, of cargo equipment rather, um, so to be used across a range. Mm. You know. uh, since you were on the types or variety of cargoes that you handle, um, so could you share with us how varied is it? You know, give us some examples of the very common ones. Um, so the one that we've used then before, yeah, for example, that was an A-frame. We've also we have a lot of um, uh, offshore um, ROVs, remote operating vehicles, and they ha they have to be um, often have like a mezzanine deck that goes on board, and and it'll. It, um, we'll put on a, an ROV and they come on and off vessels. There's dive equipment which um, um, that we sometimes mobilise on and off. So there's, there's, a, there's equipment that's going on and also sort of stabilisation, various stabilisation equipment um, that goes on and off the vessel. And then there's also cargo. So it's, it's relatively varied in what we do in the size. Um, I guess it's the equipment that's going to be more frequently mobilised on and off because... Um, the cargo is really going to be varied and bespoke depending on what we're carrying in terms of the cargo. But for the equipment, I guess that there's less variety in that side. So that's probably the stuff we're seeing more often. Of. Mm. Okay. It sounds like your job is really, really interesting because you, you have to, you're, you're, you're creating bespoke services. Yeah. <laughs> Not something that I would imagine happening actually, to be honest. Like I know the successful shipping industry was really the container coming up with the containers that that's fixed right and that enable yeah. more efficient uh, moving of, of supplies and, and goods around the world 
So there's also yeah. another market, I guess, uh, in, in providing bespoke services um, yeah, exactly. for different kinds of equipment. Yeah, and, 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 and you know, our vessels are really just a platform that can be used to serve the industry, or right? it's like a, um, uh, a deck in the water, basically. That and that's why the various bits of equipment that are mobilized on and off, mm. um, that's why it varies. Mm. Okay. Um, well, just one last question from me. Uh, yeah. What can our finalists expect when working with you, your team, or M MMA offshore uh, on on this project? Yeah, sure. So, uh, of course, our access to our vessels to um, and, and, you know, case studies where we can trial out solutions and test various solutions. Um, that's something that we would, would look to offer. Uh, we have facilities in Singapore that we have access to. So um, that could be offered as well. And, um, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, there, there is a number of, we have some technical expertise internally that would be worth working with and access to, to classification societies and relationships with the nose to work collaboratively with them. So having those technical expertise, the engineering capabilities, naval architects and, and the likes and, and access to, to relationships within classification societies, I think that would be something that would be worthwhile us um, offering to, and bringing to the table to work with a potential solution provider. Mm. Are the vessels uh, or in, in Singapore as well, some of them? Yes, um, we have some in Singapore. Of course, they, they, uh, they're they always on the move and, and off to various projects and work. So that's obviously something to bear in mind. But um, we have, uh, yeah, we have a number of vessels. Um, our, our fleet's about 26, 27, and we've got probably about um, 15 or 16 in and around Southeast Asia um, with their home base off in Singapore or Batam. So. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, that's all for me. Do you, actually, do you have any questions for, for, for us? <laughs> no, I, I don't have any questions. Um, I, I look forward to seeing if we can generate solutions out of this. I think it's, it's, a, it's quite a broad um, topic, but I think it can generate great savings to the industry. And I think um, there's a lot of potential interesting parties outside of what we do as well that would be interested in solutions such as this. Hmm. Okay, and maybe just one more question. Uh, as in, you you work on um, you also work with startups, right? Uh, so, have you had experience working with startups on on this kind of uh, challenge statements? No, uh, not on this um, particular challenge statement. You know, you know, as I said, we would work with a with another company to develop a a solution previously, um, a small company, but we um, which we did implement. It's still it's still something in development and, and being fine tuned, but it, um, as I mentioned, it's it's um, unique to the equipment type, um, so not not beyond this, and that's why we, we're excited to work with Smartport mm -hmm. and hopefully help facilitate further uh, interactions with the startups on solutions. I hope so too. So, but, but that's great. Um, in having some kind of experience working with startups is, is great because um, their culture and everything, the way they work, is just different from a larger corporation. Um, yeah, exactly. so having that kind of understanding is is really good. Um, yeah, and that's that, that's kind of the uh, yeah. you know the, that's sort of my team's uh, remit is really being that facilitator between and bringing the benefits of a of a corporate as a, um, organization with the relationships and access um, to bringing a product to market, but also understanding that a startup is um, you know they bring their benefits, but also they you know they're a different. Um, in a different stage so understanding that and helping facilitate that relationship and process is what we what our group's about yeah thank you yeah. well that's 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 really good uh and um thank you so much for your time today uh we may have mm -hmm. questions after the session they typically come in the form of emails yeah, so no problem. reach out again when they do come through my mailbox <laughs> no problem happy to help answer them all right thank you so much uh greg um i'll see you again soon hopefully uh, when we do our selection of the finalist. And coming right up, we have some information on, on next steps. Okay, so if you would like to explore all the innovation opportunities that were mentioned today, um, head over to our website, www.peer7.sg or scan the QR code uh, that's on your left, I think. And the application deadline is on the 10th of August. So, so do bear in mind to put in your customized proposal quickly. Uh, it has to be customized because it is uh, to address the particular innovation opportunity that you are targeting it. All right. And um, 
Do we have anything else to share today? Um, yes, we do. So we have our final roadshow uh, on the 29th of July. That's this week, 4 p.m. on common incident data collection across uh, PNI clubs. And that's a new one for Smartphone Challenge this year too. And that's all. So I'll see you guys again on Thursday. Bye guys.